Welcome to Stagecoach, where you'll find the best Western books on the market and the men and women who write them. This podcast is brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, home of the best-selling authors in the Western genre. This is your host, Ginger Winters. Join us on the Stagecoach as we take a ride back in time to the Old West with Lady Law by Ken Farmer, read by the author. Chapter 1 Soldier Creek, Chickasaw Nation The water-wrinkled hand reached up out of the muddy river and grabbed an exposed root from a cottonwood tree sticking out of the bank. The weakened man pulled most of his bedraggled body up onto the clay slope with intense effort. The bank bordered Soldier Creek at its confluence with the Red River. He lay on the shore, half out of the water, trying to catch his breath for several long moments. It came in ragged, gurgling spurts as he coughed up dirty water tinged with blood and phlegm. Finally, he managed to roll over on his back where he could breathe better, although the breaths were short, irregular, and choppy. He raised his head with some degree of effort to look down at the hole in his once white shirt. The profuse amount of blood that had leaked from his body had long since washed away after almost ten hours in the river. The man managed to tear the shirt away from the ragged bullet hole with his left hand. It was no longer bleeding, but he still reached over and grabbed a handful of rotted leaves and red clay, pressed it over the hole, and pulled the torn shirt back. He got another fistful, reached under the shirt, and mashed it into the second hole just below his collarbone. He finally regained enough strength after resting for several hours to crawl completely out of the water and up to the dry, leaf-covered forest floor along the creek. The injured man rested for a while again and then managed to get to his feet with the help from a piece of a hickory limb lying beside his leg. He reached up and pushed the long, black, matted hair from in front of his ebon eyes and slowly looked around at his surroundings. Men killer live. Skeen's Boarding House, three weeks later. The beautiful, statuesque brunette in a black-fitted, single-button morning coat, her tiny waist accentuated by a red patterned bustier with a gray underbust, set her carpet bag on the porch, and went inside the stately Victorian house. She came back out a few seconds later wearing her black flat-top John B. Stetson gambler's hat, accompanied by a slightly built shorter man. She turned to him. I got my telegram from the Marshal Service in Washington. Marshal Brushy Bill Roberts looked deep into her steel-gray eyes. And... They gave me permission to go unattached for as long as I want. It's a new program that actually allows a deputy United States marshal to roam anywhere in the states they are needed, reporting directly to Washington with special deputy marshal status. Bill grinned and pulled out a white envelope from his inside coat pocket and handed it to Fiona. She glanced at him with a puzzled expression, removed an official-looking document, and read it. Well, congratulations, Special Marshal Roberts, and welcome to our exclusive club. I suppose we should partner up. My thoughts exactly, Special Marshal Miller. So, now what? Well, first we go to Fort Smith and pay our respects at Judge Parker's funeral with Bass and the others. A look of pain crossed Bill's face. I think I'm getting a bit tired of going to funerals. Fiona nodded. I know. She paused to allow him to gather himself as she knew he was still experiencing recurrent bouts of depression over the tragic and untimely death of his fiancée, Millie. After that, we'll see where the wind blows. What about home base? We need a regular location to receive our list of trouble spots. Don't see anything wrong with Gainesville. We have plenty of friends here to forward notices when we're out and about. There's train service east, west, north, and south. 
plus we have the rafter ash ranch available to rest our horses and ourselves as the need arises agreed bill pulled out his gold pocket watch opened the case to see the time train leaves in uh, an hour fiona nodded unusual watch she said looking at the filigreed cover a gift from john chisholm when i worked for him over fifteen years ago in new mexico nice you knew chisholm started his cattle empire just twenty miles south of here didn't know that his big white house as it was called was located in bolivar and his brand was the Long Rail. The ranch stock was referred to as Jingle Bob Ear because of the unique cut on their ears. Now I didn't know that either. I understand he moved his operation to New Mexico in 66. Knew that. Just didn't know where he came from. She grinned. Now you do. Shall we go? Fiona bent over to grab her bag, but Bill beat her to it. Uh 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 no need to get in the habit of that. Carrying my bag is in the same category as calling me ma'am. <laughs> Point taken. He picked up his own bag and they walked out to the street where their horses, his Morgan gilding Tippy and her Appaloosa Diablo, were tethered to upright iron posts with rings on the top. They had already tied on their saddlebags. They attached their bags to the saddles with the long tie strings and each swung easily aboard. Bill glanced over at Fiona as they turned their mounts and headed north on Dixon Street. Interesting silver crucifix you've got hanging around your neck, she grinned. As you know, I don't wear much jewelry, but this belonged to my great-grandmother in Italy. It's over two hundred years old. Well, beautiful. Pickens County Chickasaw Nations. The Cherokee renegade stirred around inside the tiny abandoned fisherman shack he had been holding up in while his wounds healed. He picked up the hickory limb he had used to get to his feet when he crawled out of Soldier Creek four weeks ago, more dead than alive. He looked down at the almost healed holes in his chest and nodded. Huh, Cherokee medicine strong. He slapped the stick across his palm and then pushed the rickety door open. It was hanging only by one piece of leather from an old shoe. Mankiller eased down to the creek bank and pulled a narrow leaf from a cattail. He tied it around his head to keep his long, nasty hair from his face, turned and headed off through the woods to the northwest. The sun was setting as he squatted down in a grove of sweet gum trees and watched the farmhouse. It was located on a narrow dirt road a little more than two miles south of Oakland. After two previous farms he had watched, this was the first that didn't have a dog. Only one man, half Chickasaw and half black, his creek wife and preteen boy lived there. Mankiller waited with a patience known only to the Indian. Three hours past dark, a gibbous moon had risen just above the tops of the trees. The last lamp went out inside the house. He got to his feet and stealthily crept toward the back. The Cherokee could make out a two-foot diameter stump with a single-bit axe stuck in the top, obviously used for splitting kindling for a wood-burning kitchen stove. Mankiller easily pulled the blade free, checked its edge, and dropped the hickory stick to the ground in favor of the axe. Pausing for a moment to make sure there were no sounds coming from inside, he crept up to an open window and quietly crawled through. There was enough light from the spectral half-moon streaming through the windows that he could make his way around the dinner table to an open door. The renegade could see a coal oil lamp with just a hint of a burning wick on a table near a bed. It didn't shed any appreciable light, but there was enough flame that the owners only had to turn the wick up. He could make out two adult forms on a bed underneath a patchwork quilt. Stepping to the edge, he raised the axe high with both hands and brought it down forcefully on the nearest form, splitting the man's head like a ripe watermelon. The sound of the blade striking his skull was loud enough to wake his wife with a start. 
She sat bolt upright, wiping blood and brain from her face, and saw the outline of man-killer standing over the bed. The quilt and sheet were already covered in blood from her husband. Her piercing scream split the night for a brief moment and stopped abruptly when the sideways swing of the axe caught her across the throat. The grisly severed head bounced off the headboard and then to the floor on the opposite side of the bed with a thud. Mankiller saw a double-barreled shotgun leaning against the wall between the nightstand and the bed. He turned the wick up on the lamp, picked up the old weapon, and checked the chamber. It was loaded. Mama? He spun around at the sound of the voice and pulled the trigger on the tin gauge. The twelve-year-old boy in the doorway was blasted completely back into the other room with most of his face and chest completely obliterated by the full load of double aught at close range. Ah, oh, stinking half-breed. The renegade looked at the bloodied body nearest to him on the bed and spat on it. Opening the drawer in the nightstand, he found four shells for the shotgun and slipped them into his pants pocket. He paused, took them back out, placed them and the gun on the blood-soaked bed, and then glanced down at his ragged, filthy pants and shirt. There was an old three-drawer shiffer robe against the near wall. In the top were two pair of blue bib overalls and several chambray shirts, one boiled off-white shirt and a red union suit. Man-killer held the overalls and then one of the shirts up in the air. Ah, oh, these do. Thirty minutes later, Cal Man-killer walked away from the clapboard farmhouse in clean clothes, a gray slouch hat, the shotgun, five dollars and sixty cents he found in a jar in the kitchen, and a flour sack full of foodstuffs. The tongues of flames behind him licked out from under the eaves and hungrily consumed the cedar shingle roof. They cast an eerie, flickering light on the surrounding woods. Now, man-killer, fine she-devil marshal. Fort Smith National Cemetery, Fort Smith, Arkansas. A large number of deputy United States marshals, including Bass, Jack McGann, Selden Lindsay, Lost Hart, Fiona Miller, and Bill Roberts, gathered in the slow drizzle for the graveside ceremony of Isaac Charles Parker. His interment was taking place at the Fort Smith National Cemetery, so designated by the United States government in 1867 because of the near 400 Confederate and almost a 1,000 Union soldiers already buried there, many in unmarked graves. A number of ladies stood with the judge's widow, Mary O'Toole Parker, to comfort her as the Reverend W.D. Graham eulogized the great man. Isaac Charles Parker was a man of rare character, in his 21 years on the bench, he tried over 13,000 cases, and 79 men went to their maker when they danced on his gallows. To quote the judge, I have ever had the single aim of justice in view. No judge who is influenced by any other consideration is fit for the bench. Do equal and exact justice is my motto. And I have often said to the grand jury, Permit no innocent man to be punished, but let no guilty man escape. Many of us who knew and worked with him were well aware of his philosophy. If he had his druthers, he would personally abolish the death penalty. He often said, It is not the severity of the punishment that is the deterrent, but the certainty of it. He let his gaze drift over the assemblage and then continued, Today he walks with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He has gone home. Let us pray. Bass held an umbrella over Jack as he swung along with his crutches. The carriage was only twenty yards away. Be sure not to get that cast wet. Winchester'll have your hide, commented Bass. Ha! Think it's already too late. This drizzle's almost heavy enough to swim through. Need to go by his office when we get back to Ardmore anyways. What time's the train supposed to leave? Um, uh, make it eleven. We make it plenty easy. 
We even have time to change clothes. I feel naked without Romulus and Remus, said Fiona. Romulus and Remus? asked Loss. That's what I call my ivory-handled peacemakers, after the twin brothers supposedly fathered by either Mars or Hercules, raised by a she-wolf, and founded the city of Rome in Italy, according to Virgil. Virgil who? she smiled. Publius Virgilius Mauro, an ancient Roman poet of the Augustan period, a few years before the birth of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing you just said that I understood. I know about him. My mama made me go to church with her. They had Bible study for us young'uns, called it Sunday school. Fiona rolled her eyes and grinned. And that's a good thing. What's a good thing? That they had a school on Sunday to teach you about Jesus, the gospel, and basic catechism. Loss shook his head. If and I stay around you much, gonna need an interpreter. It's like listening to Bass talk engine or Judge Parker hand out a sentence. Well, speaking of Sunday, Angie's expecting everybody to come to the house for Sunday dinner. Looks like we need to have a meeting anyways. Easy enough, Jack, since we're all taking the same train, responded Brushy Bill. Lynn, Pickens County, Chickasaw Nation. Mankiller opened the front door of Ashlyn Tubby's Mercantile, the only general merchandise store in the small agricultural community. The purloined shotgun was carried loosely in the crook of his right arm, and he was wearing the clothes he also stole. He looked like any other Indian farmer in the area except for his long hair, which was tied back at the base of his neck with a leather thong. It was still early in the morning, and there were only a few other shoppers in the store. A two-inch brass bell attached to the header tinkled when he entered. The store smelled of cedar sawdust floor sweep. The small, balding storekeep looked up from behind the long glass top counter that ran along the east side of the store. Come right in. I'm Jade Ashland Tubby. What can I get for you today? Cal looked closely at the man and finally asked, Huh, need shells. He held up the shotgun. Well, what gauge is she? Not no. Ashlyn Tubby's face took on a puzzled expression. Your gun and you don't know what gauge it is? Fine. Several of the other customers, a young woman with her seven-year-old cotton-headed daughter and a grizzled white-bearded old-timer, took notice of the conversation. The owner shook his head. Look on the top or side of the receiver. Should say what she is. No read. Well, he leaned forward and squinted at the weapon. Looks to me like a ten gauge. He reached back and grabbed a box of double-aught shotgun shells from a shelf. See if these here fit. He broke the gun over and slipped the two rounds in the chambers. Huh, shells fit. Mankiller looked through the glass top of the counter at the handguns on display. Maybe so, you trade for Remington, me see. The storekeep reached into the case, pulled out the 1875 Remington Single Action Army, laid it on the counter, and set a box of 4440 shells beside it. These go with every handgun I sell. Pistol ain't much good without ammunition. The Cherokee picked up the revolver, pulled the hammer back several times, and then spun the cylinder. We trade. He opened the box and started putting shells in the nickel-plated pistol. Jade scratched his chin. Well, I don't know. He glanced at the shotgun in the crook of Mankiller's arm. She does have the treble wedge fast hammerless feature, but it looks a bit worn. Not know what is treble wedge thing. It means you cocks when you break the barrels over. Me know that. Mankiller keep. He held the Remington up. Now, I ain't said we'd trade yet. I think I'm going to have to have a little boot. Say... Five dollars, said Mankiller Keep. He lifted the greener with his left hand and pulled the rear trigger, blowing the slight built Chickasaw back into the gun rack and shelves behind him in a spray of red. The woman and little girl screamed at the ear-splitting thunderous report of that tin gauge. He spun around and pulled the front trigger, taking out both of them, blattering blood and brain matter all over the table stacked with bolts of cloth they had just been looking at. 
The old man customer picked up a shovel from a nearby bin and charged the Indian through the acrid gun smoke. Damn you, red hide bast! Man killer cocked the hammer of the Remington and pulled the trigger, sending the slug to the middle of the old timer's stomach. The man staggered a couple of steps forward, dropped to his knees, and then fell to his face. The shovel skidded forward to the renegade's feet. The Cherokee stuffed the box of pistol shells in one of the large back pocket of the bib overalls and then grabbed the box of shotgun rounds and shoved them in the other. After stuffing all the paper money from the cash register in his front pockets, he glanced around, spied some dark broadcloth suits, and grabbed the largest he could see. As the Indian headed in the direction of the back door, he slung the dirty, tattered old gray fedora from his head, snatched a new black, tall-crowned, uncreased cheap hat from a table, and tried it on. It was too small. He picked up another, set it squarely on his head. It fit. Mankiller casually continued his way out the rear of the store just before the town marshal, and several of the local citizens burst through the front door responding to the gunfire. Good God Almighty, exclaimed Marshal Arlen Cole as he looked around the blood-spattered store with his colt in his hand. Bile rose up in his throat. The cloud of gun smoke was slowly gathering closer to the 14-foot ceiling. Miss Simpson and her little girl are dead, Marshal, said Carl Anoa Tubby, the barber from next door. And so's poor old Jade. Oh, Lord of mercy, his whole face is gone, added I some love a Chickasaw Freedman. Other townsfolk started pouring into Ashland Tubby's mercantile. The Marshal glanced back over his shoulder, holstered his pistol, and started waving his hands. Out, out, everybody out. Don't need no crowd in here. Best leave the door open so some of this damn stinking smoke can drift out. Isom, you stand guard and keep the good folks a lin out. They ain't needful of seeing this. Marshal, old Ab's still a breathing, said Ed Baber, a local farmer that had been passing by and followed them into the store. He knelt down beside the old man and did what he could to stop the bleeding. Sam, go fetch Doc Carlisle ordered Cole to one of the citizens standing just outside the front door with his hands in his overall pockets. And the undertaker. McGann Cabin, Arbuckle Mountains, Chickasaw Nation. Fiona was bouncing baby Sarah on her knee and listening to her giggle. She looked up at Bass standing by the native stone fireplace drinking his after-dinner coffee. Here tell you got a telegram from Fort Smith. He nodded. Piz that Bill was right. They's changing a coming down the pike. He took a sip from his cup. Being transferred to the pass office. You going? asked Selden. I reckon so. This is what I do. Mind I probably can't do nothing else, or leastwise don't want to. There's malefactors and outlaws on the scout just about most any place you've a mind to look. What about applying for a special deputy marshal designation and be a roamer like Bill and me? Oh, pondered on it some, but I got a tad bit of a different situation than you and Bill. Ten kids of my own, plus the two adopted, Mame and Hubert. I'm mostly, usually no more than day two away from the house and don't see as it'd be any difference working out a pass. Besides, it's pretty obvious the new judge ain't quite the egalitarian Judge Parker was. Egala what? asked Loss. Being fair and equal to all concerned, said Fiona. Don't understand why y'all can't just talk Merkin. It is American, or English to be more exact, and for one it's using one word as opposed to seven. Understand? Law shook his head. No? Bill grinned at Lawson, then continued with the conversation. Yeah? Heard he's getting rid of all the coloreds and Indian marshals. How about you, Jack? Well, got me a couple of three more months with this here cast. He tapped on the hard plaster with his index finger. So, reckon I can still think on it some. 
Angie turned around from checking the pies in her stove, popped the dish towel against her thigh, and wagged her finger at him. There'll be no thinking on it, Jack Marmaduke McCann. You'll not be traipsing all over the country chasing outlaws and other scourge of the earth with bass way down to Paris. Uncle Winchester's already told ye that they want ye to be the town marshal at the Chickasaw capital in Tishomingo, with a whole rasher of deputies to back ye up. Now, I've had me say. She's got a point there, Jack. Fiona and I aren't saddled with the family, so Angie turned to Bill and stamped her foot. Saddled, is it, William Roberts? I didn't mean it that way it sounded. What I meant was we aren't tied down. Angie's green eyes burned completely through him. Oh, the best way to get out of a hole, Marshal Roberts, is to stop digging, admonished Bass. When you've known Angie O'Reilly McGann long as I have, you'll figure it out. That red how ain't just for decoration. Bill grinned and nodded. Ah, the better part of valor is discretion, in the which better part I have saved my life. More than once, Shakes, Falstaff in Shakespeare's Henry the Fourth, Part One, Scene Five, interrupted Fiona. But I am glad you quoted it correctly. Most people try to say discretion is the better part of valor, which is backwards. Y'all are going to be like two cats in a sack. You work together very long, observed Loss. Oh, probably not. I'm kind of like Bass. I've seen her shoot and. Anybody can shoot like that, I want to stay on the good side of. Figure we compliment one another. She's faster. Heck, I never even saw her hands move before those twin colts of hers roared simultaneously when she nailed Mankiller. Surprised hell out of him, too. But I'm a better shot. Wouldn't count on that, Bass and Fiona glanced at each other when they replied simultaneously. Seen her hit three six-inch targets at two hundred yards with a Winchester and almost sounded like one shot, said Bass. Bill glanced at Fiona and cocked his head. Impressive. We'll have to go heads up sometime. She glanced at him out of the corner of her eye and smiled a little wry grin. Roberts turned to Lindsay. What about you, Selden? You got any plans? Ah... Think I'll just keep on keeping on, unless they try to transfer me. Bought some land west of Ardmore, been developing it. Gonna take up cattle ranching when I retire. If and I have to do it ahead of schedule, well, that's all right, too. Already got most of the fencing in. Loss, you ain't said nothing, commented Bass. Well, I'm waiting on some Angie sweet potato pecan pie. No, I meant about your work. Marshalling and all. Oh, well, I reckon I'll stick with Sale, at least for a while. He paused. Howsomever, have been given some thought to opening a restaurant in Ardmore, though, of late. Selden chuckled. <laughs> well, now see, Loss, there you go. Thinking about doing something where you'd eat up all the profit. Oh, I wouldn't do no such a dad burn thing. He stared down at the floor. For one... She wouldn't let me. Everyone in the room simultaneously asked, She? Law stared at the floor and scuffed his feet around. Uh, been writing Miss Penny Wiseman down to Athens, Texas? He looked up. Y'all remember from the race thing in Gainesville? She run the Fletcher Davis meat sandwich booth and, you know, called them hamburgers. He's her uncle on his wife's city side. We, uh, been talking about opening a hamburger place in Ardmore. Gonna call it the Lost Penny Restaurant. Chapter 2 Lynn, Pickens County, Chickasaw Nation What do you think, Doc? Old Ab got a chance? Town Marshal Arlen Cole squirmed in the ladder back chair as he rolled his hat around and around by the brim. Dr. Carlyle slowly shook his head as he blotted the old man's forehead and held pressure with a cotton dish towel over the wound. Gut shot. If he's bleeding internally, there's absolutely nothing I can do to stop it, and there's no way he'd survive surgery. Think he'll ever regain consciousness? Be a miracle if he does. 
A bona fide miracle. Think he's older than me and you put together. As if on cue, the bearded old-timer moaned, fluttered his eyelids, and whispered hoarsely, Drink. I'll get you a little water, Ab, said the doctor as he got to his feet. His eyes were now fully open. Whiskey. Need whiskey. I uh, don't think that'd be a good idea. I've been shot in the lights before, in Lincoln's war. Whiskey done the trick. R r rye whiskey. Carlyle looked at Marshall Cole, shrugged, and nodded. I'll run across the street to Clara's parlor house. Spect is she has some. He turned and headed past Isom Love, standing guard and out the door. The doctor grabbed a feather pillow from a table of bed linen, shifted Ab's head, and stuffed it underneath. That better, Ab? Do for now. Gotta be honest with you, Ab. Ain't likely you're gonna make it. No way in hell I know how to stop the bleeding inside. The old man nodded. Yeah. Been there for, just needs a whiskey. He rolled his head slightly to the door to see Marshal Cole enter with a bottle of Sam Thompson pure rye whiskey. Damn, that's the good stuff, Arlen. I use that in my practice, for medicinal purposes. They've been making that up on the Mongahela River in Pennsylvania since, uh, 44. The Marshal glanced at the doctor and grinned as he handed him the bottle. Uh-huh. Doc Carlyle knelt down and held the bottle up to the old-timer's lips. Easy now, just a little. Ab took a swallow and then another. He closed his eyes and softly sighed. The doctor put his fingers on the side of his neck. I'll be damned. His pulse is stronger. He lifted the cotton towel from the entry wound. Huh. The bleeding is all but stopped. Old Lab opened one eye and looked at Carlyle. Yeah, feeling some better, Doc. Give me just another little touch. He held the bottle for him again as Ab took a third swallow and licked his lips. God's own nectar. Did you get him? Who? asked Marshal Cole as he got up from the chair and knelt down beside the old man. The engine, what done all this? He shot Jade with his shotgun. Miss Mayweather and her daughter took the screaming, and he blowed them to perdition with the other barrel. He raised his right hand a little and pointed at the bottle. Carlyle gave him another little sip. He sighed and continued. I didn't see no call for all that, and so I grabbed up a shovel and went after him. That's when he shot me. Well, sir, felt kind of like I'd been kicked in the stomach by a mule, so I kissed the floor but I seen his feet shuffle round by the counter whilst he put the ammo in his pockets and cleaned out poor old Jade's register. <sighs> he took a ragged breath. Pears he grabbed some clothes and a new hat and then perambulated out the back door, pretty as you please. Could you describe him, Ab? asked the marshal. Sure. Ugliest engine I ever laid eyes on. And a big scudder, too. Hair was long, like them renegades wear it, and he had a big white scar from his left ear to his chin. Well, son of a gun, exclaimed the doctor. What? The marshal turned to his left to look at Carlyle. He had pulled Ab's vest back to cover the dish towel pad over the hole and felt something in the front pocket. A plug of Brown's Mule chewing tobacco. Look here. The doc held up the half-inch thick plug the size of a deck of playing cards. There was a hole where the slug went completely through it. I'd say this slowed down the bullet enough so it had only penetrated a little into his stomach. This stuff is hard as a rubber boot heel. Ab raised his head a little. Is that my chaw? Carlyle nodded. Damnation. Just bought that this morning down to Moore's Drug Emporium. Now it's right. Well, saved your life, you old fart. The marshal took the tobacco from the doctor, stuck his finger through the hole, and shook his head. Think I've seen just about everything now. The doctor looked about the room at the carnage, nodded again, and took a breath, and turned to the Chickasaw freedman standing guard at the door. Isom, go fetch a litter from my office, would you? 
There's a couple of them in the back room. Yes, yeah, sir. The colored man went out the open door and headed down the street to the doctor's office. Oh, say, Marshal, did hear him say something. Now, don't know if he was a talking about what he did or there was a reference in his name, but he done said it twice. And that was? Questioned the Marshal. He said, Men killer keep. Skeen's Boarding House, Gainesville, Texas. See anything of interest? asked Brushy Bill after he took a sip of his coffee. He was leaning against a hand-carved mantel over the fireplace in the parlor. Fiona, sitting in the dark green velvet love seat, thumbed through the stack of telegrams from Washington that had arrived while they were at Jack and Angie's. Nothing that jumps up. Oh, hello. I may have spoken too soon. What is it? It's a request from a former deputy United States Marshal for assistance in ferreting out a sophisticated ring of grifters and extortionists up in Garden City, Kansas, where he's promoting a prize fight. Excuse me? A prize fight? I don't see your interest. Well, for one, it's a three-round exhibition rematch between the great John L. Sullivan and the current title holder, Gentleman Jim Corbett. A Sullivan-Corbett rematch? Holy cow! And two, the promoter has gotten word that a syndicate out of New York is going to try to set up a nationwide betting operation. That in itself is not illegal. No, but it is if they abscond with the funds while the fight is going on or try to put in a fix. There could be an excess of a million dollars bet on that fight, what with telegraph links from coast to coast now. Well, and three, the Latham Company has signed Corbett to an exclusive contract to film the fight with Edison's kinescope device to show in those moving picture parlors that are being set up all up and down the East Coast at $22 a minute. Where there's money being generated, count on Monty Banks and malefactors to be drawn to it like flies to honey. Who's the promoter that's asking for assistance? Fiona got a wry grin on her face. William Barclay Masterson. William Bar- Bat? Bat Masterson from Dodge City? Among other places, yes, replied Fiona. Well, well, this could prove to be interesting. Sounds good to me. We can go down to the depot and send him a reply. Well, what's the best way to go? Fiona placed the flimsies on the coffee table and leaned back. As I recall, the gulf in Colorado goes through Wichita. We can switch to the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe west to Garden City. Bill looked down into the crackling fire for a moment. That means it goes through Dodge City, right? She nodded. Oh, I see where you're going. We get off in Dodge City and ride our horses to Garden City. It's only about 50 miles west. Be a lot less noticeable as horsebackers as opposed to us unloading from the train. Bill bowed to her. Right you are, my lady. Right you are. Arbuckle Mountains, Chickasaw Nation. The big black 4x2 coal-fired steam locomotive slowed to less than 8 miles per hour as it climbed the grade to top the small but ancient mountain range. The Gulf and Colorado Railroad would stop briefly in Oklahoma City before continuing on to Wichita, Kansas. The Arbuckles was one of the oldest mountain ranges in North America. Her once majestic craggy peaks had eroded down over multiple millennia to just a little over 1,400 feet above sea level. Thrust outcroppings of granite laid out in rows stuck up through the prairie grass on the east side of the tracks like they had been planted by some giant farmer. On the west side, the tracks parallel the Washita River as she cut through the range toward her rendezvous with the red on the south. The big locomotive chugged up the 4% gradient, passing through a rock cut on the way to the ridge. Immediately after passing through the cut, three masked men sprinted out from behind a large gray boulder and quickly caught up with the red caboose. 
The first outlaw jerked the rear door open, rushed inside, and slapped the brakeman on the side of the head with his pistol, just as the man was getting to his feet from a bump. He slumped to the floor of the car like a pile of cut string. A rivulet of blood trickled from the split skin over his temple. Fiona and Bill sat in brown leather-facing seats on the east side of the last passenger car near the front. Roberts, in the forward-facing seat, was reading a copy of the Gainesville Daily Register he had picked up at the depot when they boarded. Fiona, facing the rear of the train, looked up from her copy of Harper's Magazine and observed the various rock formations of the folded and faulted formations out her window. That's really fascinating, the way those rock layers were folded over. <laughs> Look like some kind of ancient Christmas ribbon candy. Bill looked up with a puzzled expression on his face. Excuse me? Did you say Christmas ribbon candy? Where? I said like, and it was back there in that cut we just passed. Oh, he buried his face back in the paper. She smiled, looked down, and turned the page. Goodness! This is lovely. He looked up again. What? A poem by Alice Archer Sewell James. Listen. Nay, lips so sweet, ye must not be so red. Else were all roses for your sake but dead. Would you rob us of summer for your sake? Our pittance of dear paradise would take and lock it in the garden of your smile, where our bereavement charmed us is a while. Nay, lips so sweet, ye must not be so red. We have a problem. What? That last line is not part of the poem? She lowered her voice. I know. Don't turn around till I give you the word. We just picked up some train robbers. Three of them. She surreptitiously glanced up from under the brim of her black gambler's hat. There's one on each side, collecting the passengers' valuables in small flower sacks at the back of the car. The third is behind and in the center of the aisle with his gun drawn. I got him. Fiona laid the magazine down across her knees. Now... She and Bill simultaneously rose to their feet in the rocking and swaying railroad car. You gentlemen have made a grievous error. We're Deputy United States Marshals, she said, just loud enough to be heard over the clacking of the wheels. The man in the back raised his pistol and shouted, Hell, you say! Fiona's thirty-eight forty Colts appeared almost magically in her hands and roared simultaneously. Both rounds impacted the gunman in the center of the chest with audible thuds not two inches apart. A puzzled look came into the young man's eyes above the blue bandana. They rolled back into his head as his knees buckled. He pitched forward on his face like a falling tree. The other two dropped the sacks, threw their hands in the air, and looked down at their accomplice, dead, at their feet between them. We give, we give. Don't shoot, don't shoot, for God's sakes, said the smaller of the two on the west side. He looked down again as a pale yellow puddle grew around his feet. Bill glanced over at Fiona, grinned, and shook his head. They stepped down the aisle toward the two remaining outlaws. She jerked the mask down from each of the men. Marshal Roberts, these are just boys. Believe you're right, Marshal Miller. Who are you fellows? The older of the two replied, We're, we're, we're Billy Boy and Franklin Norgard. He looked at Fiona and frowned. But, but you're a woman. Just noticed that, did you? Uh, no, sir. I, I mean, no, ma'am. It's just, I... He glanced at his younger brother, Franklin. Uh, we ain't never seen no woman or, or lady law afore. Yeah, I've heard that too. Well, now you have. Who's that? She pointed at the body in the aisleway. Uh, uh, that, that's our cousin Clifford. He, he told us this would be like picking daisies. I do believe he miscalculated. Bill turned to Fiona. Don't you? 
It would seem so. She spun around at the sound of the forward door to the car opening behind them, drawing Romulus and Remus again in a blur. The blue-clad fifty-something conductor literally slid to a stop and threw his hands up until he saw the silver badge on Fiona's red paisley bustier over her white blouse as she pushed the lapel of her black morning coat back with her thumb. He looked at Bill and saw the identical crescent and star federal badge pinned to his gray wool vest. Uh, can I put my hands down, marshals? His eyes flicked back and forth between the two. Unless you've come to rob the passengers, too, quipped Fiona. Uh, no, ma'am, uh, I'm the conductor, uh, Marvin Schwartzwalter. I was in the next car, and I heard— She grinned and holstered her weapons. Bill still held his Colt Thunderer on the two would-be robbers. The conductor looked at the body on the floor. Is he, uh— As they come, responded Roberts. Marshal Miller, if you'd hand me your set of manacles, I'll cuff these two ne'er-do-wells. My fingers getting a mite tired. We'll be good, said Billy Boy. Honest engine, added Franklin. Right, mumbled Bill as he started fastening the shackles about their wrists. Well, Marvin, they came in the back door. I suspect you need to check on your brakeman if he was in the caboose. Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Ah, uh, that'd be Arlie Needham. Uh, he, he's been brakeman since they opened up this section of the line to Wichita. Fiona shook her head. I do wish everyone would quit calling me ma'am. It's Fiona, F.M. or Marshall Miller. Uh, yes, my, uh, Marshall Miller. You're F.M. Miller? I, I didn't know, stated the conductor. She held up her hand. I know. I've heard just about all of them. And yes, I am. Now go check on Arlie. The conductor, eased by the two outlaws, stepped over the body of Clifford and grabbed the door lever when Fiona interrupted him. Marvin, what's the next town? Uh, that'd be Winniewood, uh, Marshal. Better signal the engineer to stop so we can offload these two. Uh, we were uh, not scheduled to stop, but if uh, uh, Arlie ain't all right, I I'll, I'll signal the locomotive. I appreciate it said Bill as he pushed the two young men into a seat. I'd sit there and be real quiet, boys. He tilted his head toward Fiona and leaned over closer to them. You sure don't want to make her mad. They'd be singing your monody. Uh, ain't got to say that but once, Marshal. Uh, what's a monody? asked Billy Boy. Ode to your life, Robert said softly over his shoulder as he turned away. Both the boys' eyes got big as saucers. As the train pulled into the Winniewood station, Bill turned to Fiona. I can't believe what you did back there. What was that? He had the drop on you, even had the hammer cocked, and you still drew and fired before he could pull the trigger. That's twice I've seen you do that. How do you do it? I mean, I'm pretty fast, but I don't think I could come close to you. Well, it's pretty simple, really. In the first place, I don't think he had ever shot anyone before. And two, I read in a medical journal not too long ago about eye-to-hand coordination. And just what does that mean? It takes longer for the eye to perceive movement, send the signal to the hand to pull the trigger, than it does for me to pre-plan to draw and fire almost three times longer. It was no contest. You just have to have the nerve to do it. Most don't. In other words, a planned action is much faster than a reaction. Precisely. Ah, but therein lies the rub. I believe the quote is, To sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death what dreams may come. When we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. But you got the meaning right. You have to have faith and trust that your rounds will fire. That's why I use two guns. Never know when there'll be a misfire. <laughs> I may have to take that philosophy to heart. 
Fiona had a wry grin on her face. Better now than when it's too late. Santa Fe Depot, Wichita, Kansas. Bill and Fiona were leading their horses, Tippy and Diablo, down the cleated ramp from the stock car. It was almost two hours until the westbound Santa Fe was due. What say we cinch up and give the boys a little ride? They've been cooped up in that car for over ten hours. I imagine they're getting a little sour. Good idea. I know I am. Are you familiar with the Wichita area? I've been here a time or two when I was working for the Pinkerton Detective Agency. <laughs> well, I'd say it looked like it's changed some. The whole country is changing. I'd say we'd be putting our horses out to pasture and getting one of those newfangled automobiles. Some guy named Henry Ford in Detroit, Michigan, just made one he calls the quadricycle. Gasoline-powered with four bicycle tires. Will do over ten miles an hour. Heck. Tippy can beat the hell out of that at a road trot. All day? Well, for me, I'll take my horse. He knows what I'm thinking, well, most of the time. You do have a point there, Mr. Robert. You do have a point. They tightened their cinches, mounted, and rode off to an open area near the depot and loped the boys in large circles for fifteen minutes to work the travel kinks out. When the exercise session was finished, they reined toward downtown at a trot. It was a little over a mile. As they reached the downtown area, Bill noticed a saloon a half block up ahead. Well, uh, how about a beer? My treat. Fiona glanced at him from under the brim of her hat. How much time before the train leaves? He pulled out his pocket watch from his vest and snapped the cover open. Uh, hour and fifteen minutes. She nodded, and they reined in at the drover's saloon, dismounted, and tied up after letting their horses drink from the trough. They loosened their girth a little, and then stepped up on the sidewalk. Bill pushed one side of the bat-wing doors open. After you, Marshal. Thank you, sir. They stepped inside, waited a moment until their eyes adjusted to the dim light. Smells like every other saloon I've ever been in. Tobacco smoke, stale beer, vomit, and urine, said Fiona. Bill grinned. Uh, you get used to it. Speak for yourself. She followed him to the bar. The portly, balding bartender with a white towel in his hand stepped over from where he was drying shot glasses. Will it be, gents? He quickly corrected himself when he perceived that one was a female. Uh, I mean, folks. Ah, uh, draw me a cold beer, please. Fiona, what are you having? I think I'll have a glass of Cabernet Sauvignon. The uh, only red wine we got is Merlot, replied the bartender. That'll be fine. He grabbed a beer mug, filled it from the spigot, blew the excess foam off, and set it in front of Bill. Turning around, he picked up the dark bottle of wine, pulled the cork, and filled a tea goblet half full. Ain't got no regular wine glasses, lady. She smiled. This will do fine. Fifty cents. Bill dug a Morgan silver dollar out of his vest pocket and laid it on the bar top. The barkeep picked out a couple of quarters from the register, scooped the dollar up, and placed the change in its place. Roberts nodded and put the coins in his pocket. Much obliged. He raised his mug in Fiona's direction. To an interesting trip. Heaven send thee good fortune, Shakespeare's Merry Wives of Windsor. He nodded, and they each took a sip. Mmm, good. Bill wiped his upper lip and set the mug on the bar. How's your mind? She wrinkled her nose. Methinks this fruit of the vine has aired just a touch too much. Say, maybe a month or two. Should have gotten a sour mash. A dusty working cowboy down the bar shuffled his way toward Fiona. Well, well, what do we have here? A woman in a man's clothes? He turned to his friends. What do you boys think about that? Bill looked at the man. I'd suggest you... Fiona placed her hand on his arm. I can handle this. 
Reckon we got a woman in man's clothes or a man trying to look like a woman in man's clothes? Which is it? He winked at his pals. How's about you and me going upstairs and see? She looked at him out of the corner of her eye without turning her head. You know, cowboy, you're interrupting my conversation with my friend here. I strongly advise you to move back where you were. You strongly advise. Turning again to his friends, y'all hear that? He or she strongly advises strongly, mind you. Ha! Oh! He seized Fiona's arm and pulled her around to face him. Quick as a cat, her right hand grabbed his crotch with a grip like a bear trap. She palmed one of her colts in her left and jabbed it under a nose that gave every appearance of having lost more than one disagreement. He squealed like a pig under a gate as she slow walked him backward toward the door. Her steel gray eyes took on a chatoyant shimmer. Now, you feckless bastard, there's only one reason I don't kill you right here and right now, and that's because I'd have to pay for the cleanup. She continued with her track toward the front. Just so you know, I'm a deputy United States Marshal, and I don't backwater for any man, much less an ignorant detritus from a dung heap with bad manners. She shoved him backward through the bat-wing doors. He stumbled, fell to his knees on the boardwalk, with one hand going to his bruised privates, the other tried to stop the bleeding from his nose, all the while whimpering like a newborn puppy. <coughs> Fiona turned and headed back into the saloon, flipping her pistol back into its holster and shaking her head. It's true. Stupid does go all the way to the bone. She looked at his associates on the way back to Bill. Either of you having any? There was no reply from the other two cowboys except for a shake of their heads. Didn't think so. She sidled back up to her spot next to Bill and grinned. You told me something a while back about an expression a friend of yours you call Big Casino said often. Uh, what was that? He said a lot of things. Never let him get set. He grinned and flicked his eyes at the bar. I uh, took the option of ordering you a sour mash while you were taking out the trash. It's a gentleman and a scholar you are, Brushy Bill Roberts. Well, one out of two isn't bad. She picked up the shot glass and down the aromatic amber liquid in one swallow. Damn, lady, that's hard to do. She nodded and looked at him out of the corner of her eye and wheezed. Nothing to it. Let's head back to the station. He smiled and touched his hat. I was going to suggest that very same thing before you have to kill somebody. Well, to coin a phrase from Bath, never killed anybody what didn't need killing. She turned and headed toward the door, commenting to the two cowboys as they passed them, assisting their rubber-legged friend back inside. You boys stay out of trouble now. You hear? Kemp, Panola County, Chickasaw Nation. Cal Mankiller tied up his stolen Blood Bay gelding in the alley back of the first bank of Kemp. He pulled the ten-gauge greener from the boot, walked around the corner to the front, and went inside. There were four customers waiting at the teller windows, a local lawyer at one and three girls from the Bloomfield Academy, an Indian girls' school located three miles northwest of Kemp, at another. They were picking up cash for a bazaar their class was holding the following week. The inside of the bank smelled faintly of fresh lemon-scented furniture polish recently used to clean and shine the hand-carved counters and teller windows. The Cherokee glanced briefly at the customers, raised the shotgun, and cocked both hammers. All on floor. Not say two times. The lawyer spun around, now see here. He never finished as Mankiller pulled one of the triggers and blasted him back against the counter where he crumpled to the floor like a wet newspaper. 
The girls immediately screamed at the roar of the big gun and then at the blood that was splattered all over the counter and them as well. He pulled the second trigger. The three Chickasaw teenagers were standing close enough together that the pattern of the double-aught buckshot caught them all. The impact threw them against the near wall where they collapsed in a bloody pile on top of one another. The three tellers behind the counter had their hands in the air. All money, now, put in sack. He pitched the flour sack over the top of the barrier above the counter. Mankiller reloaded the shotgun while the tellers were nervously emptying their cash drawers. He caught a glimpse out of the corner of his eye of the bald-headed bank president peeking above the Wayne Scott High railing that separated his office from the lobby, his eyes wide in fear. Swinging the muzzle of the double-barrel dispenser of death around, he fired again. The entire top of the portly banker's head disappeared in a cloud of red tinged with gray mist. Much of the acrid cloud of gun smoke slowly drifted up toward the 14-foot tin ceiling. Mankiller looked at the missing half-moon chunk of splintered rail and one-inch thick ash paneling where the president's head had been just a few short seconds earlier and almost smiled. He turned back to the totally panicked tellers, walked toward them and held out his left hand to the nearest. The slight-built man in his twenties held the off-white cotton sack toward the renegade. His hand shook so hard he almost dropped the nearly full bag. Mankiller pulled the other trigger just as he grabbed the money from the man's hand, blasting him back into the other two and almost cutting him in half. Shifting the shotgun to the crook of his left arm, he drew the Remington he took from Ashlyn Tubby's mercantile and shot the two men in the head as they tried to get back to their feet. He pulled a narrow strip of latigo that he sometimes used to tie his hair from the pocket of his black broadcloth coat with the two short sleeves. The Cherokee looped it around the top of the sack twice and then smoothly tied a half-inch knot. Mankiller glanced around at his handiwork with his dispassionate obsidian eyes and sauntered out the back door. Thank you for listening to this episode of Stagecoach, brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, the home of Western excellence, where the best of the Western authors can be found. Visit our website at dspublishingnetwork.com. Please join us for our next episode as we continue with the adventures of Fiona May Miller in Lady Law by Ken Farmer. <laughs>